We're entering into uh, the Advent season, and uh, the series is uh, The Promise of Christmas. Christmas itself is a promise. As we uh, look back at it, we recognize that God was faithful to his word. And we recognize when we look forward that God is still faithful to his word. And that's what we want to uh, look at. And this morning, Christ prophesied. It reminds us of the faithfulness of God. And we're going to look primarily at Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 69, or 67, actually, through 79. Uh, and we call this uh, the Benedictus. This is, this is the, the song of Zechariah. Uh, and to really understand it, we have to have the background story, which you find earlier in Luke chapter 1. But I'm not going to read all of that for you. I'm just going to kind of remind you of it, okay? I know some, many of you know this story. Uh, at the time of Christ, uh, there were many priests. There were probably over 2,000 priests in Israel. Uh, I guess that tells you that priests had big families. I don't know. But uh, they multiplied. And because there were so many, they couldn't all work at the temple at once, obviously. So every two weeks throughout the year, a different team of priests would come. And, and uh, so Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were old at this time. They had not had any children. Uh, he went, and by lot, they would choose who would go into the temple itself. Most of the worship was done outside the temple building. But the temple itself was composed of two parts. The holy place, where they would bring in the showbread, they would bring in, they would light the candles, they would uh, light the incense and the prayers right before the veil. The veil separated the place that was the holy place from the holy of holies. And that's where the presence of God was. And on this occasion, the lot fell on Zechariah, probably once in a lifetime opportunity to go in and burn the incense and bring the prayers right before the veil. I can imagine that he was very nervous about this, very excited on the one hand, but very nervous. It was very clear that there were those who did not uh, prepare themselves that went into the holy place that were, were put to death. And so uh, I'm sure that he spent hours preparing his, his own heart preparing the prayers that he would pray for Israel. And he went in. Usually there was a crowd outside waiting as the priest went in, uh, and then when he would come back to see if there was a word from God. And as he was praying, an angel appeared to him. And the angel uh, told him, God has heard your prayers. You're going to have a son. Now, I pretty sure that that wasn't on his list. <laughs> I don't think that was something he was praying for. It was past the time for he and his wife to have children. Uh, and yet God knows the inner desires of our heart. It's a wonderful uh, truth that we, we get out of this. And uh, instead of uh, being overjoyed, he was overwhelmed. And he said, well, how, how can that possibly be true? We're, we're too old to have children. And the angel said, well, because you didn't believe, you will be silent until it is fulfilled. So for nine months, a little over nine months, uh, he wasn't able to speak. When he came out of the temple, the people were waiting. He had spent a long time there, and they thought surely there would be a word from the Lord. And when he came out, he made signs, hand signs, <laughs> but he couldn't speak. And for nine months, he couldn't speak, but God's word uh, was faithful. And his wife, Elizabeth, soon became pregnant. She hid herself for five months, thinking maybe this was, this was too much to really dream. But at the end of that time, as the baby was born, the whole area knew about it. Certainly the whole community turned up on the eighth day of his life uh, so that they would see this miracle child that was born. It was the custom at that time, not only for the circumcision to take place, but the child would be given a name. And everybody in town were sure that they would name this boy after his father. That was the tradition. The firstborn son would get, take on the name of his father, Zechariah. And so when they asked Mary, or not Mary, Elizabeth, 
she said, no, his name is John. This was the name that the angel had given uh, uh, to Zechariah in the temple. And obviously, he had somehow communicated that to his wife. And uh, so they weren't willing to accept her, her word on this. And so uh, they made motions to the, to the father. Uh, it's kind of funny because they acted like he not only couldn't speak, but he couldn't hear. He could hear. And uh, he called for a tablet. And he wrote on the tablet, his name is John. And as soon as he did that, everything changed. His mouth was opened up. His heart was opened up. And in verse 67, we read, Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior, the royal line of his servant David just as he promised through the holy prophets long ago. And now we, have, we'll, <clears throat> we will be saved for our enemies who hate us, all who hate us. He has been merciful to us and to our ancestors by remembering this sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so that we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And then he turned to his child and he said, And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from the heaven is about to break upon us to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Reading through verse 60 uh, or 79. And there's four stanzas, if you're looking at this as a song, uh, of this song, but every one of them point to the faithfulness of God. The first stanza talks about the faithfulness uh, to his promises. God is faithful to his promises. Now, we need to understand that there had been 400 years in Israel with no prophet. And now the word of God is coming uh, with power. But the prophets had spoken some 700 years earlier, some 500 years earlier. The prophets had promised that Jesus would be born of a woman. Now, that, you'll find that one clear back in Genesis chapter 3. That, she would be, that he would be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Exactly where he would be born. That he would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2. That he was to come from Abraham in Genesis 12 and repeated in Genesis 17. That he would come from Isaac son of of Abraham. He had other sons, but it would be through the line of Isaac. Uh, That he would come from Jacob. Isaac had other sons, but it would come through Jacob. Jacob, we know, had 12 sons. The oldest was Reuben, but the, the line did not come through Reuben because of things that he did. It came through the tribe of Judah. You read that in Genesis 49, 10. Later, when David uh, committed himself fully to the Lord and and wanted to build a temple, God said the lineage would be through David. Now, David was uh, from the tribe of Judah, so it wasn't a breaking or a changing there. It was just a narrowing. So all of those were prophesied. In fact, in the birth and early years of Jesus, there are more than 40 prophecies of the Old Testament fulfilled. Just in the the birth and early years of Christ. There's, there's many more uh, about his death and his resurrection. So God was faithful to his promises. He was faithful to send a mighty Savior. Literally, it says, the horn of salvation has come. In 2 Samuel 22, we read this that, that expresses that beautifully. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield 
and the horn of my salvation, the horn speaking of the power, the power of my salvation, he is the stronghold, my refuge and my savior from violent people, you save me. You also see the horn of salvation mentioned in Isaiah chapter 54 and 55 and, and 61. So God was faithful to the prophets of, of the Old Testament, those words that he gave them, inspired 700 years before Christ was born, 500 years before Christ was born, they were fulfilled. God is faithful to deliver us from our real enemies. Notice he says, you will be saved from your enemies. Now, if, if a Jew at that time heard it, they would think, ah, the Roman Empire, because they were oppressed by them. But he went on to say, all those who hate you, all those who hate you. Jesus warned his disciples that, and, and all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. They would be delivered according to the covenant given to Abraham. Remember, when God called him, his name was Abram, <laughs> not Abraham. Uh, God added uh, to his name, added actually the name of God in the middle if you, if you take it apart. And he gave him a covenant in Genesis 12. Again, in, he repeated it in Genesis 17. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you. From generation to generation, this is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. He was delivered to serve in holiness and righteousness. God, God doesn't uh, work out this plan, and Jesus didn't die just so that we would be comfortable, just so that we would have uh, a, a forgiveness, but that we could serve him, and to not just serve him, but to serve him in holiness and righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 9, we read these words, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from every act that leads to death so that we may serve the living God. We are cleansed not because of good works that we do, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can serve him in humility. We can serve him in obedience. And we can serve him in love. The third stanza of the, of the, the song of, of Zechariah uh, has to do with his son, his little son, he calls him. Uh, and it, it is, God is faithful to proclaim his salvation and forgiveness. Part of the promise of Christmas is this message will go out and will touch lives. Uh, he would be proclaimed, Jesus would be proclaimed as the Most High. He said, you will be the prophet known as the prophet of the Most High. Uh, we are able to give testimony about Jesus that he is the king. He is the most high over all. It would be proclaimed that there is salvation in Christ alone. After uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when his early followers were brought in before the courts, they said, we, we can't stop talking about Jesus because there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And it was to proclaim the forgiveness of sin. Uh, he said, because you will proclaim that he has come, you will also proclaim the salvation that includes forgiveness of sins. In Luke 24, 47, Jesus gave this appointment to his followers and to us. Uh, it was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. That was, that was part of the charge that Jesus gave to his followers, and it's the charge that we have today to faithfully proclaim his salvation. There's no better time. I tell people, yeah, you know, I, there was someone, I was talking to someone the other day, and they said, well, Christmas was not, uh, the birth of Christ was not on December 25th. That's the, some sun god, and, and the, the Catholic Church set that up. And, and I said, you know, it really doesn't matter at all. It is the time when people think about 
different things than they do the rest of the year. Even with this pandemic going on, there are people who are preparing for Christmas. Many of them have no idea what they're preparing for. We lit the Advent candle this morning. Uh, a few years back, and, and when I was pastoring the German church, we had different families doing it just like we did here. And there was a young couple that were fairly new Christians, and we asked them to do it, and they did it. And, and then afterwards, they said, you know, uh, we've done this all our lives in our home, and we had no clue why we were doing it. And so they said, we did what every young couple uh, would do today. We Googled it. <laughs> And you said, do you know what it's all about? I thought it was was exciting. I I let him go on. Uh, He said, you know, Advent is the word that is talking about not just the first coming of Christ. This is actually the word that's talking about the second coming of Christ. This is what we're celebrating. Not that he has come but that he is coming. It was just just wonderful. And I I hope that maybe some of you, if you've lit, lit the candles all your life and you didn't realize what you were proclaiming, but you're proclaiming that he's coming again. The advent of Christ is yet to come. In the final stanza of this uh, prophecy, he talks about God being faithful to shine the light of his mercy on all of us. It is the morning light that reminds us of his mercy. I I don't know uh, about you, but there are sometimes you wake up in the morning and you know you got this to do and you've had this problem and maybe you've got this sickness, you got all these things, but there's something about the sun coming up that that lifts the weight a little bit. The light of the of the morning. And it should. For one thing, uh, It reminds us of how faithful God is. No matter how dark the night is, the sun's going to come up. The sun's going to come up. You can count on it every morning. And I know, you know, it's the turning of the earth. The sun's not going anywhere. But, uh, well, it is too. Everything's moving, but it's okay. But the faithfulness of God, the sun will rise. And notice what he says about it. It's the, the God's tender mercies the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. And those who have been sitting in darkness, the darkness of sin, the darkness of hopelessness, are going to see a great light. They're going to see Jesus Christ and and his glory. Uh, In John chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, I've told you all this so that you may have peace. Because that's where the light leads us. It says to guide us to the path of peace. I think if there's anything that uh, the world desires, I mean, it's kind of the joke that whenever uh, they're having a beauty pageant and they ask uh, the contestants, what did you want? They always say, peace on earth. (laughs) I think if you polled all the people Uh, peace would be really high. Oh, if we could just have peace. Peace with with our enemies. Peace with our God. Peace with ourself. And Jesus said, I told you, you're you're, going to have peace. Here on earth, you may have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. In Isaiah 26, 3, they're similar. It says, you will keep them, you, God, will keep them in perfect peace who trust in you, those whose thoughts are fixed on you. That's the only path to peace when we put our faith in him. There's something very unusual about this song of Zechariah, about the verbs in it. I want to review them with you a little bit. Uh, It it says, he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent his mighty Savior. We have been rescued. Do you notice? Past tense. This was at the birth of John the Baptist. Jesus would not even be born for six more months. And yet, 
he proclaims this in the past tense. Why? Because what God promises is done. He is so faithful that you don't have to wait to see it. It's already completed. So as we enter into this Advent season, looking for the second coming of Christ and celebrating the first coming of Christ, what should we do? i just give you uh, three or four, four recommendations. First of all, uh, in response to each of these, these uh, parts of this song, prepare your heart by believing the promises are true. You say, well, of course we believe. Do you? Do, does your life show that you believe the promises are true? Do you believe that he has come? And I think most people, you know, the evidence is pretty clear. Jesus did live upon this earth. Even those who uh, dispute that he is God or dispute that he was the Savior, they, they have to admit he lived. Do you believe that he's coming again? That's, that's the challenge for our heart. And it's not only the challenge, it's the promise. It's the promise. If I believe he's coming again, I can get through the dark days that I'm struggling with here. If I believe that he is coming again, I can believe that there is a heaven where we will spend eternity with him. I can believe that he will give me what I need, where I am. We have a, a friend, some of you know her, I won't mention her name, but she's really struggling with the job that she's in. And, and she's saying, I, I just need to get another job, just get another job, just get another job, just get another situation. In fact, if you talk to her, you find that's been her whole life, whole life. She didn't like that situation. She went to another situation. She didn't like that situation. She went to another situation. She's not dumb. She just finished her Ph.D., She's been on a job less than two months. This is a horrible job. I want to do something else. And my heart goes out to her because I know that the next job is going to be just as bad as this job. And, and it's going to be just as hard as this situation because she doesn't believe God can bring her through it. She thinks she has to get out from under situation. God has not promised to take away the mountains He's promised a way for us to get over the mountains. God did not take away the Red Sea. He parted the Red Sea so that we could go, so they could go through on dry ground. God has promised that you'll have no temptation. In fact, basically, the Bible promises you will have temptation. But in Corinthians, he says, there is no temptation taking you, but that is common to mankind. And then right in the middle of that verse is the key. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you can overcome it, that you can come out through it on the other side. Do you believe that he came? Do you believe he's coming again? Secondly, open up your mind to the knowledge of deliverance in him. Acknowledge his salvation and accept it. Acknowledge that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be holy and we can serve him in holiness and righteousness as long as we live. As long as we live. I, I, I think it's interesting wording that he said as long as we live uh, because we're going to serve him in holiness and righteousness for eternity. But the emphasis was we can serve him now and holiness, and righteousness. Acknowledge his salvation and accept it. Acknowledge that he is the power that we need. He is the strength that we need. We had uh, a young lady in, in the Bible college I went to, and she was prone to give word of testimony almost every chapel. <laughs> uh, but her, her word of testimony always began with, Satan has been bombarding me all week long. He's just been making me miserable. He's always bothering me. And, and this would happen, you know, day after day, week after week. One time I leaned over to a friend of mine and I said, isn't that wonderful? 
Satan spends all his time with her. The rest of us are okay. <laughs> yes, there are battles. Yes, uh, there, there is an enemy who tempts us and who tries to bring us down. But as we acknowledge the salvation and accept it, there is joy. And there's peace. Number three, confess your sins and ask for the promised forgiveness. It, specifically in the promise of Christmas is the promise of forgiveness. Forgiveness. We all need it, don't we? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need, we need forgiveness for past sins. We need forgiveness for failures in our life today. We need forgiveness uh, that, that re reassures us that we belong to him. Receive the forgiveness by faith. Jesus said, uh, Jesus didn't say, John said in, in John chapter 1, that Jesus came to his own people and they rejected him. They received him not, but to as many as received him. To those that believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. The power, the authority, that, that word is is the word that we get dynamite from, dunamis. He gave us the power to become the children of God. And number four, allow God's cleansing light to guide your steps. You know, I, I, it is true that we live in an uncertain time. And, and our uncertainties are pretty mild compared to some uncertainties in this world. You know, we're we're uncertain whether we'll be able to travel. We, we have plans after Christmas to go to Prague and, and our family, our daughter's coming up from Macedonia and our son and, and his, his son and our soon-to-be new grandson's wife, I guess. I don't, there, I don't know if there's a term for that. <laughs> but uh, uh, they're all supposed to be there in Prague and in a couple of days in Brno. We're not sure if that's going to happen. You know, we're not sure with, with, if the borders will be closed, if the flights will be shut down, uh, if we're not able to go there. We're not sure about that. We live in a time of uncertainty, but we can be sure of one thing. God will give us the light that we need for tomorrow, for today. We don't, we don't have to know what the future holds. And, and as I mentioned that to you, I, I, you realize that our uncertainties are pretty mild there's 14 missionaries in Haiti that are uncertain if they're going to live another day. There are Christians uh, in Nigeria who have had their houses burnt down and their churches destroyed and their pastors put to death and in many other countries as well. There are people who gather in secret in North Korea knowing that if they're caught, they will be put in prison at least, maybe something worse would happen to them. But we need to allow God's cleansing light to guide our steps. Walk in the light of salvation. We don't walk around like, oh, the wall is, is coming down and falling on our heads. We walk knowing that God will give us the strength that we need when we need it. I suggest that during the Advent season, you keep a journal of the faithfulness of God. Some of you say, keep journals all the time anyway. Just add a little line over there. God is faithful. I see his faithfulness here. I see his faithfulness there. Maybe you don't keep journals, and uh, this would be a great time, just during the Advent time. Uh, usually the problem with keeping journals is we start off with great vigor, and then we get sidetracked and, you know, it lasts a week or so. <laughs> so I'm only asking you to do it during, during Advent. Uh, write down about the faithfulness of God. This alone, this passage alone, talks about the, his faithfulness to the promises that he made. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to deliver us from those who would destroy us, who would hate us. He is faithful to proclaim salvation to us. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about your whole background. I know my background, and, and you hear too much about it. But I think about how someone cared for me before I cared at all and prayed for me, and how family took me in uh, when, when I really 
you know, probably was a pain around that family. I know for a while the husband of that family was out of work. And yet I was eating meals over at their house all the time. They never once said, can go home, we don't need you here. <laughs> they never once said, ah, there's not quite enough. Um, the faithfulness of God in salvation. And I know my story uh, is mirrored in your stories. Someone prayed for you before you cared. Someone cared for you and reached out to you when maybe you were rejecting. I've loved hearing some of the testimonies. I Rinaldo's over here. I remember uh, him talking about not wanting to have anything to do with that. <laughs> but he had a mother that cared, and he had others that cared. And eventually, God's grace got through to him. God is faithful to proclaim his salvation. He is faithful to shine his light of mercy on us. We are told that we can come boldly. I don't think Zechariah went boldly into that uh, the holy uh, place of the holy there. I think he went with trembling. But it says in Hebrews, we should come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And there we'll find two things. We'll find mercy. We need that for the past. You need mercy for your past, don't you? I do. And you will find grace for your future. That's what we find at his throne. We are serving a faithful God. His promises are true. They will not fail us. When God speaks it, it's not in the future anymore. It's already done. It's already done. May God bless us. Father, I ask that you would open our eyes to the faithfulness that is all around us. Faithfulness uh, in so many different ways. People praying for us, people encouraging us, people caring for us, people guiding us, people helping us. Faithfulness for your Holy Spirit that checks us when we're going the wrong way and directs us when we're going the right way. We're thankful that you're faithful to give the light that we need for the steps to come. We're thankful, Father, that Advent reminds us that you've been true to your promises for years, hundreds, thousands of years, and you will continue to be true to your promises in the days to come. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.